What do avocados have to do with Machu Picchu? The answer? Absolutely nothing. So why does the Peruvian Chamber of Commerce think that Machu Picchu can help sell avocados to Americans? In order to understand the appeal of this marketing ploy, we need to travel back in time to the 19th century. In 1821, the Italian explorer Giovanni Belzoni opened the doors to his elaborate indoor reconstruction of the tomb of Seti I in London. As we learned in episode 6, this was the beginning of a phenomenon known as Egyptomania. Egyptomania was the superficial packaging of wondrous or monstrous curiosities for a general audience in search of entertainment, not enlightenment. Its chief appeal lay in striking visuals, memorable phrases, and vicarious thrills, all within reach of a working-class budget. In order to turn a reliable profit, Egyptomania consistently put the customer in the driver's seat. He was the intrepid explorer in search of ancient tombs, he was the hero who outwitted hostile natives, he was the archaeologist who returned home to fame and fortune. During the first half of the 19th century, such cultural fantasies were accessible only through the occasional public panorama, museum exhibit, or travelogue. These were random and temporary affairs, profitable only for the duration of the exhibit or print run of the book. All this changed in the year 1858, for that was when the first submarine telegraph cable was laid across the Atlantic Ocean connecting the westernmost tip of Ireland with the easternmost tip of Newfoundland. In 1866, after eight years of setbacks and repairs, the transatlantic cable was deemed stable. Messages that used to take 10 days or more to cross the ocean by ship could now be transmitted in less than 24 hours by wire. This technological breakthrough initiated a sea change in the popular consumption of the historical Indiana Jones. With the newfound ability to transmit the written word across the globe within a mere day or two, the exploits of adventurous and daring Western avatars could now be packaged and serialized in newspapers and periodicals on a regular and affordable basis. This made available an audience far larger than had ever been tapped before, giving rise to a new business model dominated by what one scholar refers to as the attention merchants. Mostly newspaper editors and other media magnates, these bold entrepreneurs published written and visual content sure to capture the attention of a wide swath of the reading public, then resold the attention of their audiences to advertisers eager to pitch their products to captivated consumers. The first man to exploit this potential to its fullest capacity was James Bennett Jr., owner of the New York Herald. By the time the transatlantic cable was complete, the New York Herald had already amassed a daily circulation of 84,000 readers, reputed to be the highest of any newspaper in the world. In 1869, three years after the stabilization of the transatlantic cable, Bennett decided to exploit its potential to the fullest capacity. During a meeting in Paris, he met the American traveler and writer Henry Stanley and proposed an ambitious assignment lead an expedition through East Africa with the intent of locating and reporting upon the whereabouts of David Livingston. Livingston, a Scottish Congregationalist with the London Missionary Society, had achieved a small measure of global fame for a popular travelogue he wrote chronicling his crusade against the Arab-led slave trade in Africa. But now he was missing. Stanley's job was to find him. Not only that, he was to file regular reports from the jungles of Africa on the progress of his expedition for the edification of the English-speaking world. In hindsight, we can see that this was the world's first reality television show, played out entirely on the pages of a newspaper. Stanley knew that Bennett's readers were interested only in him and Livingston, not Africa or the Africans. In justifying his frequent use of the first-person pronoun, 
Stanley observed that he was, quote, writing a narrative of my own adventures and travels, and that until I meet Livingston, I presume the greatest interest is attached to myself, my marches, my troubles, my thoughts, and my impressions. He presumed correctly. For Stanley was a cultural and ethnic avatar for an audience back home, willing to part with a penny for the vicarious thrill of being put in his shoes. Readers of the New York Herald were not paying to be put in the shoes of Stanley's African porters or local Arab officials. They were paying for the temporary thrill of an exotic adventure as experienced by someone who looked, talked, thought, and dressed like they did. White skin, Christian faith, Western dress, and familiarity with the Greek, Roman, and Hebrew literary canons. Nor did Stanley disappoint, leaving his readers with a memorable catchphrase that only a Western audience would find memorable. Dr. Livingston, I presume? Supposedly uttered upon meeting Livingston for the first time in the village of Ujiji, this line derives its humor from the absurd idea that anyone other than Livingston could be the recipient of such a formal Victorian greeting in the savage jungles of dark Africa. The story of how Stanley met Livingston provided a new business model for Egyptomania, one that was premised upon the sensationalized literary fantasies of a Western avatar in non-Western lands. James Bennett Jr. pioneered this business model through the New York Herald. By the turn of the century, a new magazine called National Geographic would do the same for the field of archaeology. Through groundbreaking photography and other striking visuals, National Geographic would combine the romance and mystery of Egyptomania with the running print commentary of a western avatar in exotic lands. The first person to realize the full potential of the National Geographic venue was Hiram Bingham. Born in 1875 to an austere family of Christian missionaries in Hawaii, Bingham was 23 years old when the Spanish-American War broke out in 1898. Inspired by the war to learn more about Latin America, Bingham began to take an interest in the history of the Incan Empire. More specifically, in a reflection of the ideological bias of his day examined in episode 17, Bingham wanted to learn more about how the Incans had waged a doomed but supposedly noble war of resistance against the despised Spaniards during the 16th century. On July 11, 1911, Bingham set off from Cusco, the former capital of the Incas now located in Peru. His goal was to find Vilcabamba, reputed to be the final refuge of the last Incan king. Just five days later, he found Machu Picchu instead. After a mere five hours at the site, Bingham left the ruins at Machu Picchu and continued his search for Vilcabamba. One month later, he found it too, nestled in the thick jungle among a smattering of unimpressive ruins. Though the historical identity and importance of either site was not immediately obvious, numerous clues suggested that the ruins on Machu Picchu were not those of Vilcabamba, the last refuge of the besieged Incas. Bingham had a decision to make. He had visited two different Incan ruins and had every reason to believe that one of them, Machu Picchu, was certainly not the lost city of the Incas. But the more likely candidate, Vilcabamba, lacked the aesthetic allure of a mist-enshrouded mountaintop site. Machu Picchu was undeniably beautiful. Vilcabamba, buried in a forbidding tangle of jungle overgrowth, was an Incan encampment built in haste and bereft of splendid architecture and romantic beauty. Moreover, built as it was toward the end of the Incan Empire, after a full century of contact with the Spaniards, Vilcabamba also revealed extensive use of red tiles in the construction of its buildings. To Bingham, the lost city of the Incas should evince pure Incan ingenuity, not cultural exchange with Europeans. Seen in this light, Machu Picchu was a much more attractive candidate for Bingham's lost city even if he already knew that it could not be the last refuge of the Incas. There was just one problem. During the brief five hours Bingham had spent atop Machu Picchu, he had already managed to spot the name of a potential rival etched in charcoal on the walls of one of the temples. Lizaraga, 1902. Who was Lizaraga? Before he could tout his discovery of Machu Picchu as the lost city of the Incas, Bingham had to make sure that no other Western avatar had beaten him to the site. 
so Bingham decided to pay a quick visit to the Lizaraga home just to make sure. When a man with much darker skin than himself answered the door, Bingham knew that Machu Picchu now belonged to him. Though the man turned out to be Lizaraga's brother, Bingham already had all the information he needed to know that only he could serve as an acceptable Western avatar to audiences back home. For the Lizaragas were, as Bingham himself later put it, half-castes. No one in New York, Paris, or London would pay money for the vicarious thrill of being put in Lizaraga's shoes. With that, Bingham returned home to regale the American press with tales of the lost city of the Incas, Machu Picchu. Following the same model of reporting that made Stanley and Livingston famous, journalists from all the major New York papers lapped up Bingham's evocative description of Machu Picchu. Bingham became an overnight sensation. At the invitation of Gilbert Grosvenor, the editor of National Geographic magazine, Bingham lectured to an audience of 1,200 at the Masonic Temple in Washington, D.C. Before long, Bingham was able to organize a second expedition to Machu Picchu under the joint sponsorship of Yale University and the National Geographic Society. The end result of all this was the next installment in the Egyptomania craze, this time featuring the Incas. As evidence that Bingham was far more interested in popularizing a romantic image of an ancient civilization for mass consumption than he was in crafting a responsible scholarly narrative, we need look no further than the title of the National Geographic article he penned upon his return in 1913, In the Wonderland of Peru, Rediscovering Machu Picchu. Inside, a whopping 250 photographs accompanied a mere 10,000 words of text approximately one photogenic image of Machu Picchu and its environs for every one or two sentences. This was a visual smorgasbord for the eyes, not for the brain, and it was transmitted to 140,000 subscribers across the globe. With the prospect of fame and fortune now before him, Bingham stuck to his preferred version of Machu Picchu until the day he died. In 1948, he exploited the manufactured romance and mystery of the site one last time with the publication of a predictably titled book, Lost City of the Incas, now considered a classic of the genre. This brings us back to the question with which we began this episode. What do avocados have to do with Machu Picchu? Absolutely nothing, of course. The Peruvian Chamber of Commerce isn't really selling avocados. It is selling a commercially lucrative Western fantasy. This is Egyptomania in Incan guise, aimed directly at the wallet of Western audiences. If this seems deceptive, it is only subliminally so. Most archaeologists engaged in deception far worse than avocados. Please join us next time as we explore the history of espionage in episode 19 of Indiana Jones in History. Thank you.